Okay, I think we'll get rolling because uh, we're very excited to have Stephen with us and to hear him talk about this incredible work. Um, just by quick introduction, um, we've known Stephen for many, many years back when we were in New York City. And uh, it's a, it's been a few years since he's been out to Santa Fe, but we're absolutely thrilled to have him join us on the Zoom. This is in conjunction with an exhibit that we opened on Friday of last week, um, titled This Fragile Earth, which is exploring the beauty and the uh, majesty of nature and our earth and the unfortunate effects of environmental damage and climate change. And um, there is a good range of work uh, from the 1930s up to the present, as well as an expanded virtual exhibition through our website, which features Stephen's recent day to night work focusing on endangered species and endangered habitats. Um, the announcement card in the first image in the exhibit is a photograph Stephen took during Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, the, the exhibit opens, um, Stephen, with a climate event in 2012, Hurricane Sandy. And this turned out to be a seminal experience for your work's direction. Um, let's start with that. And you lead us through this um, extraordinary turn that your day to night work took and, and how your focus changed. Well, it's great. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to be here. And um, especially to see so many um, few people that I know very well. Stephanie is a student of mine. And it's great to see you here. I um, thank you all for tuning in. I, I think my work really, um, uh, you know, I, I think took a turn as um, as our climate started to take a turn. I think I, I was seeing uh, things that were happening uh, that were disturbing me. Uh, Hurricane Katrina was probably the first thing that um, uh, that caught my attention, and I remember documenting that. But I, I think when it struck uh, my own hometown, you know, the tri-state area of New York, uh, that was something that um, I'd never experienced a hurricane in person before. And I remember uh, I got a phone call from Time Magazine, and they asked me to uh, document it with my cell phone. It was the first time that a group of photographers uh, documented in real time an actual uh, hurricane event. And uh, I was covering Fairfield, and this is a photograph I made. Um, uh, it was um, um, just outside of my um, area, and I, I remember seeing this wave hit the wall and thinking to myself, this was at what they call dead low tide. That's, that's how high the water was. So I could only imagine um, what the coast was going to look like as uh, the tide started to get higher and higher. And, um, and subsequently, I think um, I made these pictures uh, on the ground and, you know, I felt it was great. And then I got a phone call from my twin brother who lives in Los Angeles. And he said to me, what's the big deal? Everybody's saying it's such a big storm, but I mean, it's only a category two. And at that moment, I realized that um, I wasn't really capturing the full breadth of the story. And I'd heard on the radio that there was uh, supposedly a roller coaster had gotten dragged into the Atlantic Ocean uh, um, in a place called Seaside Park, New Jersey. So I, um, I had this crazy idea on my own. I just made a phone call to a, a, a guy who's a, been a good friend of mine for many years, Al Cirillo, one of the great pilots in New York. And I called him up. I said, Al, can you get a chopper up in the air? And he said, Stephen, I, honestly, I, I don't have any electricity, but I probably can jumpstart it. I go, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go. I need about three hours. I want to go all the way down the coast of New Jersey. I want to I want to see the damage of this storm. Um, so we did that. And this photograph uh, for me is really one of the most seminal moments from that whole experience. Uh, as we approached um, Seaside Heights, I remember seeing it at a distance and um, my breath was taken away because 
I couldn't believe a the color of the water because of the storm all of the sand had been dredged up and so the water looked like we were in almost the you know in, in Bermuda or the Bahamas that kind of turquoise color and then seeing this this roller coaster sitting in the Atlantic Ocean uh, in this dead calm sea uh, it reminded me instantly of this moment um, I was a, always been a film fan and I remember the original Planet of the Apes motion picture where Charlton Heston is riding bareback by horse at the end of the movie, and he sees the torch of the Statue of Liberty rising out of the water. It was a post-apocalyptic moment, and that's what this photograph was for me. So um, it, it will always have significance, and I think it was the tipping point. I think, um, Michelle, you and I spoke about this a while back, um, where you know I think people didn't really realize what Sandy was, the scale of Sandy. It was not that it was a cat too, it was the scale of a cat too. The fact that this, in, the entire Eastern seaboard was, um, was devastated on an unprecedented scale. I then traveled to Staten Island. I had heard rumors that there was a, uh, a house that got blown off its foundation through cattails. And so um, this was one of the things I wanted to photograph. And so I told Al, I said, do me a favor, fly over Staten Island and let's see if we can find this house that's in the cattails. And that's how I made this picture. Again, on the way down to New Jersey, um, we, we had heard about a bridge that had been totally, you know, uh, devastated. Um, and you can see, um, well, I think one of the things about this storm that was so different, there were parts of the Jersey shoreline that didn't look like it was as bad. And then there were other parts that were just, you know, completely and utterly devastated. and. Um, you know, I, I just documented the whole thing. You covered Katrina. Were you, when you were covering this in the helicopter, yes. Yes. What, was it occurring to you at the time, um, you know, this is where I belong, this is the story, um, you know, in a larger sense. This is- Yeah, this, I, I, this I, I think it, me. I actually, to be frank, I, I was, um, overwhelmed uh it was almost uh it was almost grief in a way seeing the the totality of the destruction i was witnessing from above like i could not believe the scale of this and i think um when you when you see it from above and you see um the devastation uh and then you just keep traveling you know you it's not like just one area you know it, it it's just it kept going and going and going uh, as we moved down the course of, of uh, we went, I remember we flew over the Statue of Liberty. I think that shot's coming up. Um, this is all Atlantic Beach. And, and by the way, that's, you see where the road is there. If you look closely, you'll see that it's sand. I mean, it's, it's literally like a beach now. Um, that's how much water came across here. Uh, it, it was, um, you know, <laughs> boats literally being dropped into, um, into little children's parks and, this is one of the sites that just, um, I think, encapsulated just how, you know, the scale and the power of this storm, what it did. Uh, these it boats, was, when you look, yeah, I'm sorry, Michelle, go ahead. I just, it makes you weep. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's almost like you're looking at a children's toy. It, it actually was surreal to look at this, to realize that some of those boats are, you know, 50 feet long or, 75 feet wide and they're thrown around like they're little children's toys and and that's kind of what it looked like and and so you begin to understand uh again from the remnants of this uh disaster of of what had just transpired and i think that's why i felt very strongly that this was unlike any storm i had ever seen and i i believed at that moment that i was witnessing the tipping point where suddenly we were going to start looking at storms that had uh, a scale and an amplification that we've never seen before. And this is really what has become, you know, really proven now by scientific data, which is of course that uh, over the last 15 years, we've heated at a, a rate that's almost, you know, um, 15 times uh, what it should be. So it's really, um, um, this was, you know, you, sometimes in a, you watch a horror movie, there's foreshadowing um, this was foreshadowing of, of what we are we are now living through, you know, with, with one, of the, one of the prime, you know, sort of important factors of photography is creating evidence. And it's, it's you know, it's now 11 years after Sandy. And 
I don't think in the moment at the time, I mean, we understood the destruction, but we didn't understand, as you've been saying, you know, that this was, you know, one of the first mega storms and, and it was mega, you know, not in terms of the category, but it's reach basically encompassing, you know, multiple states and so far, you know, across the Eastern seaboard and the water surge and, and the transformation um, you know, now we can look back and see that it really was a tipping point, and and this is the document for it. It it really was, you know, and I think uh, that uh, you know, in many ways, you know, my work doing this work um, started to focus uh, my mind as as an artist, but also someone who's very drawn to science. Um, this gives you an idea. I mean, people didn't even realize the scale of damage that was done to uh, Liberty State Park and the, uh, the Statue of Liberty area. That dock was completely devastated. Ellis Island, which of course is an important um, place to me personally, um, they had so much devastation on the island. I mean, it was essentially uninhabitable. They shut the island down for s almost a year to, to try to restore what was from just the damage of Sandy. Um, you know, again, they have, you know, you, you're looking at, you can see the side of this picture, the walls that the way they're, you know, contoured, they're, they're just not designed or equipped to have a sea level rise that, that came with, with, uh, with Sandy. I mean, the tragedy was the scope of the storm, but that was also the contributing factor to the efficacy of the message. For so many people, it didn't just happen to New Orleans. And no. that turned out to be quite vital in our education nationally. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think, you know, um, New Orleans, I've spent so much time uh, filming in New Orleans. And I, um, I've i always felt, you know, to, to many degree, I think most people, you know, you live on the East Coast and you know, like it's like California. Well, if you, you know, you get the earthquakes there and if you, you know, you live in Florida, you get the hurricanes or New Orleans, you know, that's where it always seems to happen. And suddenly everything changed. You know, we got hit by something that we, you know, yes, we've had, you know, rare uh, hurricane events uh, over the course of the last 50 or 100 years. But uh, this this thing suddenly looked different. It really, really did. And I mean, we've just never seen anything that scale wise look like this. I remember uh, Coney Island, I flew over and um, and again, just trying to think about the boardwalk there. And and I think this this started to make me think about um, the data and what was the science telling us about what was actually happening? This is, uh, by the way, gives you an idea. This was they took uh, the beach parking lots in Atlantic Beach and all of the destroyed houses, everything that was thrown up by this storm, they had to literally collect and they would uh, gather it in these open air, these giant parking lots. That's what they became. So there was nobody was visiting the beaches. These were literally places where they were aggregating all the garbage, all the residual trash from the devastation of the flooding that occurred. So with that, we'll make a transition. And this particular image um, from Yosemite, of course, is, is, is such an iconic you know, nature photograph or throughout throughout the history of photography. Um, but in many ways, it began a new chapter for you um, with your day to night work, which more or less up to this point, I concentrated on urban and, and city areas. And uh, we'll let you talk a little bit about you know, the the introduction into the national parks? Well, this was a really interesting moment for me on several levels. Uh, I'd been starting to use a large format digital camera uh, for the last several years. I was doing day to night with cities. So my focus really was in New York City. And the work started in 2009. And I, uh, as I began to evolve the work, um, you know, I was always, because I was in a city, night was always, I had street lights, I had certain things. So there was, from a technical standpoint, I wasn't shooting one hour exposure. So the idea of actually doing like landscape photography in the middle of nowhere was almost impossible at that moment in time, uh, because 
digital large format digital backs could only shoot like you know five or ten, you know seconds uh in terms of exposure length and then suddenly a new back came out and it allowed me to shoot for an hour exposure and suddenly i could actually capture moonlight in a photograph uh using a digital back and that's really what sort of uh, gave birth for me to start to think about doing day to night in the context of a landscape and i um remember hearing about this idea that the there was a, a story that was starting to happen within the geographic they were talking about uh the 100th anniversary of the national parks and so i pitched this the geographic with an idea i said what about if you allowed me to go into the national parks i would do a series of day to night images and i'd be paying homage to the great Carlton watkins uh, um, edward uh, moybridge because those photographers use technology in a way to document the parks that was revel revel it was revolutionary you know they the mammoth camera uh, allowed people to see details uh, had a scope and a scale that was never seen before in photography so i said what about if you guys would allow me to actually do a series like this and i remember i sent an email and a whole proposal to sarah lean who's uh, the wonderful uh, past editor of the geographic photography director and she said oh my god Stephen, this is a great idea but i don't know i'm not sure if we can if we're really ready for this yet and uh i said okay and i went out and i went out and created this photograph on my own and i remember when i finished it i uh sent it this the jpeg of this image to sarah in an email and i think i got an answer in about three minutes oh my god we want you to do this. How do we, we, how do we get you to do a whole series like this, yada, yada. So this became the genesis really for a, what became a very long-term relationship. It's been an incredible relationship that I have. I'm now, you know, a National Geographic Explorer and I'm, I work with the magazine extensively and they really become a tremendous supporter of my work and my storytelling. And um, this is how it started. It was started with this image and 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 this began really my journey into the idea of 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 telling a story uh, using day to night as a technique. One of the things that this picture always spoke to me about was it was inspired by the great painter Albert Bierstadt, who had painted this very scene um, almost 100 years earlier. He actually painted it from the opposite view. So he was looking at the sunset, which is behind me. And you're seeing this view. This is the sunrise. But one of the great things for me was to be able to capture these moments of people, the way they celebrate the experience of being physically in this park. It is truly a timeless view. Uh, it is, uh, you know, um, you will see photographs of tunnel view that look exactly like this from 100 years ago. So it, it, it sort of, for me, it, it checked so many boxes in terms of what I was interested in and curious about, but it opened me up to a world where I could say, wow, this is a powerful story. Like, look how insignificant we are as human beings in this picture. And you realize that, you know, the earth and the land and the scale and the magnitude of this beauty, it really um, made a statement for me. And it, it was, uh, I really consider it one of the most, um, you know, pivotal uh, images that I created in the collection was this, this photograph. You, and it would go on to photograph several national parks um, yes. But I'd like to just touch on something you said, which I think is really so important. You know, the early photographers that you mentioned, Mybridge and, and Watkins and even Ansel Adams, you know, at that time, their documentation of nature was used to, you know, tell Americans about, you know, most Americans. The back, paradise. The paradise. Most Americans didn't have the ability or the means to travel from wherever they live to go to these grand locations. And, you know, just as you did with, with Sandy, you're creating this sort of historical record. And so as we move into, you know, these gorgeous places in nature that you've, you've documented with the endangered species, it, it, it becomes, I think, just in the same footsteps that you're showing the public, people, these places, they may not be able to ever see and may not survive. Well, you know, I, 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 I think, um, I, I thank you for that. I, I think one of the things that I think about often, and I'm glad you brought up Ansel, because Ansel is so important to that, especially that previous picture. 
I actually have footage of myself on that um, on a rock outcropping. I was at a 45 degree angle, literally for 36 hours, tethered by rope. And as the sun was rising, I felt like I was channeling Ansel Adams. I felt like I, you know, it was just amazing. And one of the things I loved about Ansel was his ability to really show what his mind's eye was. In other words, the camera was just this vehicle, this tool. And I think one of the things I've tried to do in this work, um, the previous photograph, uh, Ropes and Bite, this photograph, uh, is to try to um, capture a place um, with a sort of sense of wonder and awe and use technology in a way where I can um, allow you as a viewer to have a deeper, richer experience in the act of looking. Uh, you know, so much of what I try to do is to get you to see uh, what I see. And um, when one of the things that I've loved about the the transfer of, from analog photography to digital photography has been my ability to suddenly become frameless in a way. I don't have to be, my work is no longer defined. Angel had to shoot four by five or eight by 10. Those were very specific frames that the world had to live within. Um, Digital does not have to work that way anymore. Suddenly I can begin to show you the world the way I see it, the way the human eye sees it. And so I've really explored and tried to push the boundaries of the medium of photography in many ways, not just in the act of compressing time uh, and specific moments throughout the day and night, but also in the way you react to my work. I think when people come in and they see these prints in person, it's almost a visceral experience and it's something I'm very, very conscious about trying to do. I want you to feel like you're there with me, you know, that you're, you're, you have a window into this world. That's, that's what it's about for me. Cause I, I, I do feel that way that, that, um, you know, they, that it's often said that, um, uh, the, the, the way into someone's soul is through their eyes. And I think that's, the way I, I look at everything. I am trying to touch your soul through your vision and through the act of seeing. And, and that's what these pictures talk about really. And, and they try to- I think it's, it's so embodied in this image of um, Greenland. And um, I know you shared a short video and we have it on our website also, but it's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, the amount of visual information that is in the photograph, but hearing your explanation, you know, this was the great melt of 2019 and the chain reaction that it could have on the oceans and feeding chains. And maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that because it's, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a masterful way of creating something it is extraordinarily beautiful, but is also highly, highly important in terms of the danger of climate warming. Well, thank you, Sid. I, I it is uh, one of those photographs. Uh, I've, I've often said that there's this idea. You go, you know, you, all of us as photographers, sometimes you have this idea in your head and you're going to go out and make the picture or, you, you know, you, you're very sort of locked into it. And I'm always saying I have to try to when I when I get to a place, I do all my homework, but then I just let go. And I, I like to say I live in the moment. I'm very present in the moment. And this is no photograph really has ever been more truthful to that than this picture, because I uh, had an idea in my head about, okay, I'm going to capture the icebergs melting. And I, it was really in my mind's eye, it was more a picture about sea level rise. And then of course, when I got there, um, I started seeing these, literally I've never seen um, so many um, whales, uh, humpback whales in my life. They were gorging uh, constantly. And it was like this, the greatest show on earth really. And, uh, but, I, I started to question why why it was so rich and then began to understand the dynamics of what I was witnessing with my eyes um, was that they were, uh, as the ice melted, everything, the sediment that was being released was feeding the plankton and the plankton were, you know, activating the krill. And suddenly when their krill are all, you know, you're flourishing and feeding on the plankton, that's when the whales start to gorge. And suddenly I realized that that at moment that my whole perspective on the scene and the story that I was beginning to tell changed. It really wasn't about sea level rise that what, what I was witnessing. 
it was about how this this idea that without ice, you know, the plankton can't survive. Without ice, you know, the krill can't survive without the plankton. Without ice, the whales can't feed on the krill without the. So it's like everything is connected. And the more I do this work, the more I'm witnessing these incredible changes that are happening in our planet. I'm seeing them in real time. You know, I like to say that I'm in many ways, uh, I'm an artist who is uh, visualizing data in a way, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make it, I'm trying to humanize these things that scientists are describing, uh, but bring them to you in a way that allows you um, hopefully to see it and, 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 um, and connect to it uh, in a palpable way. And uh, this picture, um, you know, again, 100 and over 195, I think million tons of ice um, liquefied into uh, the Atlantic Ocean, or I think it was a billion. It was an extraordinary number. And one, when you, you know, when you bear witness to something like this, I mean, people often ask me, how, how long did the iceberg stay there? You could literally see them moving. That's how fast the melt was going on. So if like, if I wasn't there at the right moment to shoot, I never would have had that iceberg. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's that you, you don't think of it in those terms. You think, oh, an iceberg, it's going to be this slow moving. It's like watching paint dry. It, it was not that way. Um, and so it was, uh, it was really an extraordinary experience um, for me in many, many ways. And um, I'm, I'm, I, it's, I, yeah. It's so interesting when we think about the history of photography and how it has always invited uh, us to to learn and invest and connect and there there's an urgency now to the work that you're doing so it isn't um as polite an invitation as life magazine might have been this is urgent and i feel that urgency when i look at these images it's um it, there is an urgency. Um, the planet is on fire in many ways, many, many different ways. And I think um, as, um, as scary a time as it is, um, I do think about uh, what the potential solutions are. And I do always have a sense of hope. And um, I could not go out and do what I do if I didn't um, feel that I could inspire change in some way, you know, in some small way. Um, and I think there are so many colleagues that are involved in the, in, in the show here. Uh, everyone is working on their own level and trying to tell a specific story that has deep meaning to them personally, I think. And that's, you know, um, why I think a show like what you're doing is so important in terms of it's opening people's eyes and educating to what's happened because you know, there's no middle ground in science, you know, uh, this idea that there's a center in science, there isn't. It's either black or it's white. There's no middle. And um, unfortunately, with disinformation, with, um, you know, uh, this, uh, everybody questioning what the truth or facts are in the, our world right now. Um, one thing, the most important thing is, is that um, this is a very real thing that is happening to us. It's um, and and we have the power to to change our behavior. And, uh, you know, I, I always say if you could do one thing, if if every person tried to do one little thing, you see how easy it is to begin to shift behavior and patterns. And that's why even little steps are really important. Um, uh, that last picture, just so you know, that was uh, in Reykjavik. Uh, of course, that was the uh, uh, the volcano that was uh, uh, an extraordinary moment. I spent uh, 21 hours uh, making this photograph. I actually landed a helicopter on top of a mountain uh, and we were essentially left up there. And um, I, what, I had this concept, I wanted to get the sun setting behind an active volcano. And I can't tell you how many things have to break right for this, but mm -hmm. I will tell you, I stood for 21 hours. And the only reason I could do that is because this was truly one of the greatest shows I've ever seen ever. Every eight minutes, that thing would explode. And um, I just want to describe to you what the sound was. Uh, as, as, as the va lava would flow through these um, uh, previously carved like, like channels in the, in the lava itself, it's like a pipe organ that would sound like a 747 engine. 
and 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 th these are the things you know it's this uh th this epic sort of it's like being witness to the formation of life on earth and i remember looking at this scene and i remember as i saw the molten lava and then i looked at the sun uh, these are the essence of life it's it's our sun without our sun we don't have life without lava there is no life so it was a, just a very poignant very powerful um uh connection between these um two very um what what they you know the sun is at this incredible distance yet it it, it seemed like it was just the most perfect marriage at that moment yeah You know, artists have always been regarded um, as dangerous, um, just as teachers and, and educators have been, um, especially to, to authoritarian and fascist movements. And I think that the danger of the artists is the effectiveness. Um, in your case, the urgent effectiveness. It is, you're seduced at first by what your eye interprets as beauty. There's so much more to learn in these images. And it's private, you know, no one's lecturing to you. No one's pointing a finger at you. It's your encounter mm. with this. And it's so moving and effective. We, are, we see people have private encounters with the work every day. It has nothing to do with us. Uh, we have no control over their relationship with it. And the satisfaction as art dealers to see people stop and stare and whisper and sometimes weep. Um, artists are dangerous. Well, that's very kind, Michelle. I, you know, that's the ultimate um, I think of any artist is to touch people in a way like that. You know, if, if, uh, if I can move you that way, then, um, then I know you there's action. You don't, you don't, you may not see it. Um, yeah. but you know, there's a, there's a component here that I believe creates action, especially in the young. Yeah. There's, there's, you know, one of the things that, um, I think I've learned over the years of doing this, and especially as I've migrated the work into endangered species and habitat, this this last series you've been showing here, which was started at Bears Ears uh, National Park, um, which um, a previous administration wanted to actually build um, a lithium mine in. Um, and, you know, if you, yeah, if you go back one, maybe, uh, but, and then um, I did this series, this is uh, of course in um, uh, outside of Yellowstone, and it's a regenerative farming um, uh, place called the JL Bar Ranch, which is just a magnificent property. And they've really been implementing some really innovative um, new ways to um, to graze uh, cattle and uh, that are, are really um, restoring um, soil. And, and, and you know, when you restore soil, what people don't realize is, is how much carbon uh, a, a really healthy soil absorbs in our environment. So, you know, it, it, these are some of the places that I documented for a big story that I did. It was a cover story uh, for the geographic on um, saving the most um, important places to save by uh, 2030 for the 30 by 30 initiative. Um, mm. And so this was, uh, the first one was of course, Bears Ears. This is uh, in Montana, the JL Bar Ranch, and then the, the the third one I think you have in here is um, see if yes, can get yes that's um, probably one of the most difficult places I've ever been to photograph. It's a place called Shai Shai Beach, and um, we had to hike almost four hours in to get to this location. Uh, and I spent about 20, 22 hours on top of a rock doing this picture. <laughs> So, um, you know, it, it, well, what I want to say here is, is, is it, it, the time element that I put into these, these photographs. One of the things that's happened through the work is um, uh, spending time in nature the way I do, watching wildlife the way I do. It's a deep, deep study. It's almost a meditation. But it's, it's, it, what I end up seeing is the things that many scientists don't even see. You know, I, I get to see the way species interact. I get to see the way they communicate in a way that's really deep and rich. And I, I find that I am now, I see the world differently through um, 
creating these photographs. I, I think it's really effectively changed my consciousness. And part of my mission now is to um, hopefully try to use these images to open other people's consciousness the same way mine's been open. And I think that's, um, if I can do that, um, that's really, uh, uh, that, that to me becomes a real driver of action. Because uh, when I spend time with the indigenous communities that I've been blessed to meet uh, through many making many of these photographs, I begin to understand how um, how they understand and see the land and they see see the wildlife and they see everything connected. And it is something that most Westerners just don't understand. And we've just been uh, our our idea of consciousness is we've had it defined since we were born, but it's not necessarily, you know, um, the only kind of consciousness there is. And so I, I've been, you know, that that's been the, one of the great gifts of this work, is how I've um, I've seen the connectedness. I've seen, I, I've I felt it, and uh, and I believe it's it's something. It's part of the language now, visually, that I'm trying to incorporate in my work. I, I'm going to, I, I think I'm going to just skip ahead to one image that I think this is um, of the bison. Of the bison, yes, that are almost extinct and. Now they're being brought back to life. This is one of those really great positive stories. Um, this was on a place called Elk Island uh, in Canada uh, with the generous support of the National Geographic Society. I've been doing a whole series on endangered species and habitats in Canada. And so I spent, uh, boy, a long, long time in a blind making this photograph. Um, and those are actual sandhill cranes in the sky that you can see. But these bison, there were only 50 left in the world, 100% pure bred wood bison, 50 were left in the world, that was it. And the only reason those were left was they had been isolated by accident. And so they couldn't uh, intermingle with other bison. Uh, and so their, their bloodline was pure. And they were able to bring those bison to this very um, remote area and, um, uh, and breed them. And so I was able to, they're now over 500. Uh, which was uh, uh, one of those great stories. And, and there are a lot of great stories out there that, uh, of things, the way the, our oceans are returning, um, uh, things are coming back. But again, there's just so much work to do. And I think um, we all have to just, um, you know, try to, um, in, you know, I, I know there are people on this phone call, on this on the Zoom, who I'm preaching to the choir. But I, I think what's, what would be great is if you can share, the, you know, that passion, with your friends, you know, you know how they people ask you, could you send a letter to all your friends? It'd be great if we could get everybody to, you know, you know, uh, stoke everybody and say, you need to let's. What are you doing today in terms of our environment? What are you What are you doing to to make a difference? Um, are you driving an electric car? Are you you know Are you changing all your light bulbs? Are you you know What are you doing? Um, um, trying to avoid using plastics. All the things that we can try to do. Planting more trees. All of that is part of, of, of how we uh, begin to move the needle as, as a, a, a species. This bison um, photograph is just so timely. I don't know if anybody or uh, on, the, on the Zoom has seen the, the Ken Burns film on the buffalo, but that's yes. also a success story. And as you were saying earlier, you know, it, the story of the bison, the story of the buffalo, the story of the indigenous, you know, this is all one big circle, and to see that coming back is a hopeful sign, both of, of us as, you know, a, a, a species, but as, you know, as these animals. Yeah, it's, 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 you can't, you know, we can be good stewards to the planet, you know, when we, when we make the effort. Um, and when we direct the message um, to our own survival. We're not doing something out of largesse. If we no. want, if we want to stay, um, we, we, it's been proven we've lost this battle of ultimate progress at the expense of our planet. Right. And, and I always say that, you know, people talk about uh, it's the end of the world. No, no, it's not. It's the end of the human race is what the end right. is. <laughs> the planet will be here. The planet will, you know, will be here. start, it'll figure out, you know, how to uh, whatever it is. Let me tell you, one thing I've learned is uh, when you're in the field, I've watched these animals adapt in real time and um, they understand uh, in many ways uh, the dramatic changes and are anticipating things much quicker than we are. 
you know, they all say the, the bird in the, you know, the, um, in the coal mine, um, it's, 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 it's so true. Um, um, you know, I, I, this was a, an incredible place that I got to it's a place called Chilco Lake. It's a glacial lake up, uh, in the Northwest territories of Canada. It's, um, you have to fly in by a seaplane and it, you get up, you fly over the ring of fire mountain range. And it's really dramatic. And I, um, I, I've never seen, uh, this was what, one of the most epic uh, salmon runs I've ever witnessed. And these bears, I was about 30, 40 feet from them up above and they never, nobody bothered me and we could cook and do whatever we wanted. They were so full, they had so much food. And um, your, what was so extraordinary was I was able to capture time through a mirrored lake. We were out there for three days and we had no wind. And uh, so that's the only reason I was able to create a photograph really like this. So, you know, it, 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 I've often said, Michelle, that I, there's so much luck involved in what I do, but I like to say, I try to just embrace um, everything and I put out energy that is um, um, positive. And it's through that, that I think, you know, the universe just, um, uh, when, when, when I'm lucky, it really just things uh, happen for me. You have to put yourself in the way of luck, right? Yeah. And this is uh, my most recent, uh, that is really uh, one of the first times I'm showing it. Um, this was uh, uh, probably the most difficult photograph I've ever had to take. Um, we went back um, almost four times to make this photograph. These are northern caribou. Uh, they're very endangered. Um, this is in the middle of the Yukon. Uh, and I had um, previously made three attempts in another location that I actually had to be helicoptered into where we actually built a blind. Uh, I had a team build a blind for me and not once, not twice, but three times. Um, the first time I spent four days in the blind uh, with 50 mile an hour gusts, somehow we survived. We never saw a mosquito, let alone a caribou. And then um, the second time we uh, built the blind, it got blown over, went back out again, rebuilt it, and then went back out again, and it was blown over again. And at that point, I just said, you know, maybe this is not a good idea. <laughs> and so we uh, literally, in a two hour period, we, um, my team, I have this amazing team that I work with there. And they said, Stephen, there is this crazy place. I just spoke to one of our scientists and said that the caribou, it's called Carcross, and the caribou are actually crossing there this right at this moment. You know, they have data that they can share sometimes. And so we knew the caribou were there, uh, but I just never knew I'd get a vista like this. And uh, we drove a, a, our vehicle because I couldn't, I had no budget for a helicopter anymore. And we literally drove a vehicle up a, a dry riverbed to get to this view. And I was inside a, 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 what is like a pup tent in a um, Toyota Land Cruiser with myself and my assistant for about 36 hours um, doing this picture. So it was pretty crazy, uh, but, but worth all the effort. Yeah, that's an extraordinary vista. Yeah, I, 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 I can't wait for people to see it up close. It's, uh, it's really special. This has been an incredible conversation. It's always an incredible conversation with you, but tonight has been, I think, just really con contemplative. And, and I'm struck by, had you not been determined to shoot Yosemite and, and had you not had the vision to know what was possible for that shoot, none of the work that followed would have happened, likely. Well, you know, it's uh, it, 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 one thing I've always said is that, you know, I, I, I like to feel somewhat uncomfortable when I work and because then I know I'm working hard enough. And I think if you're if you if you tend to set set back and, you know, uh, it's very easy to stay with something that's selling and it's successful. But it's really hard to um, push yourself into areas that are, are are constantly challenging and pushing the boundaries of whatever it is that you're after. I think as I've migrated day to night from the beginning of cities to doing landscapes, to doing wildlife, to documenting history. I mean, these are all things that are central and thematic in my work. And I've really tried to, you know, I think um, grow the work in a way um, that speaks to the the all the threads and the passions that I have in the medium of photography. So it's, it's been a very special um, journey, frankly. And I've been very thankful to have you guys be a part of it for so many years. 
Um, I don't know if many people know that you guys were really my first gallery and uh, we've been together for, for, you know, really decades. So it's, uh, it's great to be here. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I don't know, do we have time for my little quote? Yes, uh, yes, please. Okay. So I'm going to share a quote with everybody um, that I found that Einstein, I'm going to read it because it's a little bit long, but it's really special. Um, a human being is a part of the whole called by us universe. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to the affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature. Nobody is able to achieve this completely, but striving for such achievement is in itself a part of the liberation and a foundation for inner security. So I, I thought that was just a, an amazing quote. Yeah. Einstein, so. Well, well, it's brilliant because it's Albert Einstein, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think everything you wrote was pretty brilliant, but uh, it's <laughs> nice to hear him talk about the natural world that way. Yeah, and to understand the, you know, the universe. Yeah, the connection. Yeah, the connection. Yeah. Well, we'd like to thank everybody who joined us. Um, we're going. We've recorded this, so it will also be available for review on our website. We have a deep thank you to Stephen for taking time to um, put this together and for the work that he's done throughout his career and continues to do. We can't wait to see what you do next, but thank you for preserving for eternity these beautiful places. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much and thank you everybody for joining us.